point there. Uh, welcome to the show, <laughs> CJ. Uh, that's, that's why I had you on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, there's going to be different cultures, whether you're talking about the panhandle of Florida or even northeast Florida or, you know, Tampa is like its own monster in itself. I mean, there's thousands of divers in Tampa, right? And those guys very rarely like interact with the guys in Southeast Florida or like Key West even, right? Um, it's, it's crazy how divided it is, but that's one of the cool things. I actually run a tournament called the Florida Spearfishing Tournament. And it's at, we just had the award ceremony and it was really cool because you have guys like Chad Patty who dominated three categories from the panhandle you know, talking with someone like Matt Werner, who does most of his diving in like the Tampa area. I mean, this year he traveled all around, right? Right. Um, you know, and those guys are completely different than some of the monsters and animals like Rob Ruiz and, uh, you know, Steel Rocket down in Key West. Um, you know, each, each one of these little areas, they have their guys, they, they know, they all are dominant divers um, for their categories. So then when you throw them all together at an award ceremony where, you know, you're, you're sitting around in the room and you're like, wow, every single person here is an incredible diver. Like, this is cool. Like, this is really cool. No, it's, I'll speak to that too. One thing, um, you know, uh, yeah, I've been diving a long time in my little zone and, um, and I say little zone cause it's, you know, small in the grand scheme of things, but, um, you tweak your gear, you do all those little things that the locals know, right. Where you're like tweaking your gear for this type of environment and all this stuff like that. But then you travel somewhere and it's, Oh, I'm starting all over again, even though the learning curve is very steep because you've got that fundamental base. But um, that's why I think traveling is such a huge thing. And it's and it's funny, too, because you don't have to travel far to really like you're talking about, you know, Panhandle, South Florida and all that. It's like that's not that far, dude, a, a drive. OK, get this. A drive from Key West to Jacksonville uh -huh. is almost like nine hours. Like it's people, people just say, Oh, Florida, like, Oh, it's right. Right there. I mean, honestly, I know people who fly for, for drives that are shorter than that. Um, well, I'm just thinking as far as if you were to get on a plane and go, let's say, um, yeah, you could fly six hours and be in a totally different situation, Country. <laughs> but I mean, like with Florida, you could drive from one side to the other from, you know, the the Atlantic to the Gulf side and be in a completely different environment. Um, oh, in terms of species. Absolutely. We yeah. get a little bit of that here with Baja from the Pacific side to the Sierra Cortez side. It's very kind of similar, but it's just completely different diving in itself. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild, dude. Um, I, I love it though. Uh, I think if you, if you notice some of the best divers in general, they're guys who can dive under different conditions, right? Um, and, and it's funny because sometimes you'll see a guy who is an incredible murky water diver, uh, and then you put him in some crystal clean water where the fish can see him from hundred feet away and can't, can't hunt those fish down. Right. And, and like, oh, I've like, been there, done that. If you, you yeah. go take a guy who's a blue water elitist and you go slap him in some muddy water and his, his hundred foot dives turn into 50 foot dives really, really fast. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I've, I've, so like, I've seen some of my friends, uh, some of the people know my friends uh, come here from, you know, Guam or whatever. And, uh, this would be like red tide and we're, you know, just doing dives to, to 50 feet and shooting at shadows or whatever. And he's like, didn't even get out of the boat. He's like, this is, you guys are ridiculous. I'm not diving the shit. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. This is just us. He's like, dude, how do you guys do? I mean, and, but I've seen the guy dive to a hundred feet, no problem, you know? Um, so it's just interesting to see that kind of, you're right. Um, I definitely want to get into your brand and, and where your, your star, but I want to know first, like with you, obviously I would say, give us a, bit, a little bit of your background, but for you, I mean, you can go farther back. Where are you, like, where were you born your whole background? Because you said you're a marine biologist. So that's something obviously appealing to the listeners and. You know, yeah. I always like that because you look at things a little bit differently um, because, yeah. Well, the the first time that I first wanted to be or thought maybe I could be a marine biologist was when I was a kid and I, I thought I was going to find the cure to cancer in the ocean, right? I was like, well, the ocean's so big. We haven't explored it. The cure to cancer is in the ocean. By, by four-year-old logical deductioning, right? Uh, I was like, oh, yeah, for sure. We, ha we haven't been there. That's where the cure is. Um, so in the back of my mind, when I 
started going to college, I was like, ah, you know, I love the ocean. Um, let's go down that route. Right. Well, um, it was great. It was fun. And I just always thought that if I loved my job, I would never work a day in my life. And I, the idea of being a marine biologist was a lot sexier than what it actually is. Right. It, yep. it, you know, I lived on a boat for three months and then got off for 48 hours, then went on for another three months. Right. Uh, working for Noah. For I was going to say scripts or what? Yeah. Noah. Yeah. yeah, doing uh, you know, doing like otter trawl for uh, shrimp, you know, assessments in the northern Gulf, or red snapper and shark long line to you know fisheries dependent monitoring down in the Keys and uh, for FWRI. You know, I was doing all kinds of stuff like that, but it's just it's redundant. It didn't really excite me anymore, and I it made me hate. It made me hate being around the water. And where are you from originally, though? Miami. Okay. So you, and then where did you go to school in Miami or at Florida Gulf Coast university in Fort Myers? Okay. I started the spearfishing club there. Okay. Well, I actually started the first ever college spearfishing club and then convinced my friend, um, actually, if you haven't spoken to him yet, you should really talk to Farrell Tiller. Okay. Um, he started the FAU spearfishing club and he also owns uh live free diving and, uh, him and his girlfriend Kiki do free diving courses and stuff like that. And he's, a master of the spring. So definitely somebody that has another good uh, intake on what's going on in, in the state of Florida. And he's out of the Boca Jupiter area. So he's given you that like, you know, similar areas to Nick Bailey but, um, from maybe an older perspective. Right? Um, but uh, he, he's, he's an awesome guy. Where was I going with that? Oh, you were just telling us about your background, like where, oh, yeah. So I started, so you hated the ocean. Cause I understand where you just needed a friggin' break. Cause it's, you yeah. only see one side of it. Yeah, well, it wasn't really that I needed a break because I'm on the water 200 days a year now, but I'm in the water in different places, doing different things, seeing different people, yep. seeing different fish. It's always different. So it, it gathers my attention, right? Um, well, one way to look at it too is like, because I have I had a similar job where we, you know, um, we're on the water all the time. And it's like, you know what? It'd be really nice to be able to be on the water on my own time rather than being dictated right. when to do what and all of this and it's like i can do this shit in my own time yeah well you know i'm not even on my own time anymore because i'm still on you right. know clients or other people's time right so it's it's different i'm still not you know just leisurely going out and i honestly should but now i'm addicted to putting people on fish right like i used to to not shoot a fish more often than not nowadays and and help somebody else it's you know and this isn't um you know trying to say i've been there done that but it's, you know, I've already kind of checked off certain things. <laughs> I know. Like, how many times can you shoot? A, 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 you know, my thing is how many times can you shoot like a 20 pound yellowtail or a 15 pound yellowtail for us out here where it's like, right. okay, if the fridge, like my wife wants to eat, you know, say sashimi or something, then yeah, I'll do it. But if you got a buddy on the boat, that's never shot one, the stoked, like the, how excited they get, you know, it's like, and that's, and like you said, though, it sounds, it does sound like, oh, it's, you know, I'm like, but it really is kind of, it means more to them than for you. Now, if there's like a 50 pound yellowtail, then that's a different story, but you know, <laughs> right. but like, really, it, yeah, I, I literally, we'll go on trips and I'll shoot the least fish out of everybody just because I don't want to pull the trigger on everything. It's not really my reason why I'm there, I guess, but. Well, I mean, think about it. You, like exactly what you said, you go shoot a 15, 20 pound yellowtail. Are you going to be hooting and hollering? Probably not. Right. Nah. Exactly. But now, you know, you go put someone who's never done this before and they shoot it. And that's something that they've always been wanting to do. And they're hooting and hollering. Guess what? If you're not having a good time when someone else is having a great time, then then there might be something wrong. With you. That's a great point. Yeah, hundred percent. That's a good point. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I understand. Like the, the entire boat's energy is better when everyone's having a great time. If you're addicted to that, then you're in the wrong sport. Right, because that gets old real quick. I mean, there's probably people listening that um, haven't aren't as seasoned. I'm sure, and there's probably people who are listening that are seasoned, and it's true. I think it's kind of one of those. I've talked about this before with people um, where it's like, as you progress in, you know, spearfishing or whatever it is, it's like in the beginning, it's like you shoot everything. Then you start to like be a little more selective and then you don't shoot anything because you want other people to shoot things. And then, uh, then you're still like so selective. I remember thinking about it this summer. I was like, man, I hardly shot really anything this summer. 
um, I saw things, but I just didn't really want to, you know, I put a lot of buddies on fish and that, like you said, it's a great feeling. It is a good feeling because it kind of starts that. I think it's like when you have children too, when you expose them, uh, to that and they get stoked and the next thing you know, they're just like going for it. Now you've just created a dive buddy for yourself. Oh, yeah. um, whether it's your friends or your kids or, you know, I'm for a spear fishing dealer, dude, I, I give you your first hit and then you're addicted and it's, on, <laughs> you know, and you have a spear fishing company and then you sell like, yeah, it makes then sense. You, then you got to sell them the gear, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, now but you need that. three pole spears. No, sure. But, Go but ahead. I don't even, I, I used to like, it's funny. I, when I first started my company, it was just on pole spears, right? That's uh-huh. how it's supposed to be. It was, and it wasn't even supposed to be a company. It was supposed to be just building a couple of pole spears. I think I remember that because that's what I associated your, your company with was the pole spears. Like that was, mm-hmm. it was, I was, I was one of a few companies that, um, really were in the right place at the right time, in my opinion, for the, the huge uprise in pole spear popularity. Yeah. I got cool. And then it just, yeah. And then I remember yeah. seeing a bunch of other ones like that take off. And I think it was, it really stems from a lot of people that, like I said, have shot for us out here, you know, average size fish, average fish. And that's what you see most of the time. And they wanted the challenge. So now I can go after these average fish with a pole spear and really get that feeling back of like badass. Cause I remember when I shot, you know, a 15 pound yellowtail with a pole spear and I was like, I feel cool now. Like, I feel good. This is a good sense of accomplishment it's a natural progression, right? It's like, okay, I, I hit that fish with a spear gun. Now let me see if I can hit it with a pole spear, but the, you know, you guys have a little bit more open water type hunting. Um, obviously you guys do still have like, you know, the, the reef fish and stuff. Like that. And then your reef fish aren't some of the monsters that we experience in, you know, commas, right? Like our, our reef fish and groupers are, are significantly bigger than you know, some of the, your reef fish, you know, outside of like maybe some of the bass, right? Yeah. The biggest thing is the white sea bass, I would say. And that's, you know, and, and, and they're not exactly going to go take your shaft into a, a, a coral system. You know what I mean? They're going right, to, right, right. So before it was seemed like in 2015, it was like, everyone got their shit together. Right. Prior to that, pole spears would break very easily. And I mean, just to name a few, right. This, and people always say to me, oh, why do you, why don't you like, you know, just only say your name and don't push other people or whatever. Listen, I'd rather you choose the right pole spear for you. And at the time, Headhunter, Bill Fish, uh, myself, Neritic, right? Even Gaku with the taking over uh, Chris pole spears, right? There's uh, so many good options now. Whereas prior to that, there weren't a lot of good options, really. And um, I think the development of each company has like, they came out with their own thing and then this thing, and then everything just kept getting better and better. And it was just it honestly only benefited the rest of the community Uh, because then you started seeing fish that weren't landed now start to be landed because the equipment got better. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's really um, kind of interesting. You mentioned 2015 because um, for a lot of people that are diving before, I think 2015 for us out here on the Pacific side, 2015 to me, uh, represented like a renaissance, if you will, an explosion in spearfishing. And for us, I believe it was because the bluefin tuna came back and people now are shooting these 200 pound bluefin tuna. And on the right days, they're the easiest thing in the world to shoot, you know, but you better have gear like that. They're not always right. And and you got to have your gear, you know, and you got to have your gear ready for it. And that's a big thing. But, um, who doesn't want to go out and get a picture with a giant, you know, tuna, like right off your, in your backyard. Yeah. So then I remember going to like a tournament and a, that I hadn't been to in years. And it just, it was huge. All of a sudden there was all these clicks, all these groups, subgroups, whatever. And I was like, Holy crap. I didn't know this many people were into diving, but it was 2015. And I remember it because I didn't realize, like, I feel like I, I kind of fell off the radar for like four years and I came back in 2015 um, a lot of it was my job I was leaving, but, um, when I came back, it was just huge. And, um, it was a good thing because as you, like you mentioned, I think it brought like this industry into everyone kind of going in their own direction, but like trying to make their direction the best way possible. Well, I also think 
in general, the rise of social media, bless it, it's been amazing because so many people have found other people to dive with, other locations to go dive, but it's also been the worst thing in the world, right? Um, I, I try to tell my people, hey, and I see it all the time. It's like, you know, on the day of, they're sitting there posting the pictures of the fish with markings in the background of things that you know exactly where they were, when they were. And it's like, hey, everyone who doesn't know where to come hunt this fish right now at this time, come here, right? And so right. being is like, I mean, it happens with you guys with the white sea bass. The first guy who posted, it's a flock. Everyone's like, oh, they're yeah. here look for them, right? Same thing with Wahoo in South Florida, um, you know, and it's one of those things where it's not going to stay good if we keep doing this because the pressure is just, there's too many new people to the sport. And I start to tell people, wait, wait a week, wait two weeks. If this, if your, if your financial income doesn't depend on it, it and you're just doing this to big dick somebody, I mean. Yeah, that you might want to go to a therapist. It's probably cheaper than, yeah. <laughs> As far as like trying to bait it over, like if it's not, I guess, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Everyone's, I feel like my buddy said it best about this industry right now. And um, I'm trying to learn a little bit of this too, is that he's like, dude, it's like a digital land grab. And he said that. And I was like, that's so interesting. He's like, think about it. Like where this is going, the sport is not going to really shrink. Um, it's going to grow. And, you know, so what I thought was whoever barks the loudest people here, and that's what I've noticed. Like, and I'm not, that's why I never was really involved in social media, but I've seen the people that are like famous in the sport or whatever you want to call it. Like some of the people that are famous, and I say famous as the more popular guys, I guess. Some of those guys have been diving a few years, um, but they just happen to be, you know, right place, right time. They happen to post the most or whatever, whatever, what, all this stuff. But yet then now they're like self-proclaimed experts. And, you know, I'm not speaking to anybody specifically actually, but I'm just saying like, there's people like that. And that's not a good thing. Cause I feel like it just kind of leads people astray. But I think, I think that's what you reached out to me about was, you know, I made a post, um, about pop-up instructors. Yes. And, and, and yes. Like, and, and, and to be honest, I am not the best instructor out there. I'm not the deepest diver out there and I'm not yeah. the best diver out there, right? And like, let's just get that out of the way. This is not me and to stand on top of shoulders of other people to make myself uh, taller. It's just, I've been diving a long time before I ever considered being an instructor. And then I actually was right. an instructor for a very long time before I even advertised or started going down that, that route. I just see it happening more and more frequently where somebody who their first time diving was last January, and then they get good enough to the point where they feel after taking one level one that they can say, Oh, I'm going to take the level two next weekend. Right. And this is a sport where you can go from zero feet to 120 feet in a matter of a month. You really can, if you're, if there's a lot of things that have to go right. Right. But simply diving on the line 120 foot one time with 20 minutes of breathing up before that does not mean that you, or even if you take, you know, a, a level one uh, instructor course, unless you are truly able to go up and down that line with little to no breathe up, I'm talking less than 60 second breathe up and go back right down to 66 foot. Um, you're putting people in, in jeopardy. And well, I, yeah. So that's one thing that that actually Charlie and I spoke about, I don't know if you listened to the episode, but I did not. Yeah. We spoke a lot about the pop-up instructors and I understand just like school, everybody's like, I've seen in school where people just go like zero to hero and then they're an instructor. And that's one thing, but with spear fishing, uh, free diving specifically, obviously it's different. Like you said, um, there is a lot of stuff to learn. That's not in a book. And there's a lot of stuff to learn. You know, you can read a book and like, okay, cool. And regurgitate it. But what do you do when everything goes wrong? What do you do if this, what do you do if that? Like, and, um, Oh, you're uh, dude. It's, it's, it's outside of just, um, you know, I can read this in the book. It's, it's also, okay. You went down on a line and touched 70, 80 foot, maybe, maybe even a hundred foot, maybe whatever. Right. Yeah. But you now are going to be a level one instructor where you have five students going to 66 foot 
and you've maybe dove, I don't know, we'll call it 20 times right. in your life at this point, at like 20 separate days at this point. And now you're going to be in like a master. Like, look, dude, it, I wasn't even a master after 400 days. I'm still yeah. a master. I'm still learning stuff. I'm still, there are still times where I get caught off guard. And, and, and I mean, I, I dove 200 days last year alone. Right. Somebody asked me if I should, they said I should um, be an instructor for free diving. And I was like, dude, I'm a terrible free diver. Like <laughs> I am I'm terrible. But even if I got, even I got to the point where I was comfortable doing the whole hundred foot, you know, whatever, 120 feet. Um, I'm a spearfish. I'm not a free diver and I don't feel comfortable. Uh, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable you know, if you're paying me $600 a pop and all of that, like, I'd feel like I just want to make sure that I can give you every single thing that I have experienced. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's, a, maybe it's just being whatever it is, but I just wouldn't feel because it's such an exclusive discipline. Like mm-hmm. a free diver is such like Ted Hardy, I think is so great because he understands kind of the separation of spearfishing and free diving, but, um, um, you know, to be better at one, you have to understand the other, but he kind of understands what he knows, what he doesn't know. But he also is like, has been there with free diving. And it's like, mm-hmm. if I want to learn a free dive better, I'm going to go to that guy. Like for me personally, but, um, but you want to know, you want to know the thing about Ted is, and he's a great free diver. And it's not me saying, Oh, Ted's not a good free diver. Yeah. He's just that much better of a teacher. Okay. There's a, there's a difference yes. between being able to do and being able to teach and very few who can do can right. go teach right well and i think that goes back to that experience level i can't teach someone because i'm just figuring it out in my own journey even even if you are a yoda and you've been along this journey for 20 years it doesn't yeah. mean you have the patience or the 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 different ways of of, of laying out the picture and oh, 100 to understand right right that, that in itself is a skill set right like just the teaching aspect of the material and being able to get someone to understand what you're saying and yeah. also hold it with weight. Well, the holding it with weight thing comes a little bit with prestige of the instructor, right? Um, which is why I made that, I made that huge laundry list, right? I actually, I think I listed like do this a lot instructors, you know what I mean? I was like, dude, Errol, right. Sebastian, right. Like all these guys, um, you know, Martin's panic, like they're all incredible, incredible free dive instructors. And yeah, Granted, I get it. They can't be everywhere. There's thousands of people signing up to learn how to free dive. So there has to be umbrella yeah. from these, we'll call them legendary uh, instructors who then have to have their instructors <laughs> right underneath them that are now right. teaching the other people. But it's like CrossFit, dude. It's like, it reminds me of CrossFit where everybody CrossFit was like just making money off them. And so they were signing people up to get certified to be these coaches. And they went literally to a weekend class. And then some of the stuff, it's like, great, they shared it with you, but you have no idea actually understanding it and be able to teach it. Well, let's be honest, dude, my first 10 students, and I'm sorry for you guys out there, you know, I'm not going to think, but like, there's no, there's no way that those 10 people got the same, ex- the same value as right. the person who was my hundredth. Well, and to drive the point further, like in a different arena, I remember going into college and, 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 uh, you know, I went to the military Academy and, uh, in my class, like our pipeline, where it was all the football meatheads. Right. So I was in class with all my buddies and our instructor, who's an instructor there happened to be fairly sharp guy. Obviously he's a college professor and very sharp guy. And I'm in like math 100 with the rest of our knuckle dragging friends. And like, we all take this test, 17 of us, we all fail it. And then in true like army military way, he starts yelling at us because we failed it, right? Like, because we screwed up. And I was just thinking, well, if every single one of us failed this test, maybe you as an instructor failed your job of being an instructor. Because I know I studied for it. But the other side of it is, you know, looking at what he said, I'm looking at it like, dude, you are so smart. This stuff probably just came naturally to you. And you don't know how to teach to a group of guys who, and again, I'm stereotyping, but all my buddies like (laughs) that maybe weren't as sharp, as intellectual, as quick as you are about learning math, like just saying, 
well, we all fell. And he's like chewing our ass about it. I was like, you know, I always respect the guys that are doctors and they're very sharp and they can explain what's going on to you at a normal knuckle dragging level because they understand it so detailed. Those to me were like the best instructors ever. Be able to articulate that message in a, in a way that it's easy for you to understand. Right. That's key. Yeah. That's key. Yeah. So that was a really, I thought that was a pretty good post what that you did um, where you threw it out there and you're like, Hey, these are the guys that I respect or instructors um, that I and, I, and I think that's a good thing. And again, if you're not on that list, it's like, okay, this, don't take it personally. We're no, all getting, like, I even, I even specifically said like, Hey, please. Someone yeah. Like, Guess what? I got to a point where I was like, I'm tired of tagging. Uh, I've had enough of this and, you know, and or like, I don't remember their because not everyone has like the Instagram handle. That's their name. So I'm sitting there trying to look up their name. And I was just like, dude, I've, I've had enough, you know, yeah. everyone else feel free to reshare this and tag another person, you know, cause actually what I was really hoping is that it was going to spread. Um, and people would actually start to see. And, and again, I, listen, I'm not the best instructor and I'm not going to say that I'm the best free diver either yeah um you know i'm pretty good i'm proficient i, I dare to say you know on level of you know, professional right you know yeah but, i'm comfortable so, <laughs> right you know yeah what I, mean? I know what i'm doing yeah yeah exactly exactly i've been doing it long enough um but there's a total difference and i really want people i, I think there's a, a handful of questions that everyone should ask when you are for those listening when you are thinking about taking a free diving course right are you taking a free diving course? Or are you taking a spearfishing course? Do you care about the spearfishing aspect or do you want to go dive on a line? Because those are two different things, right? So first things first, let's get those expectations out of the way, right? Is the person who's teaching you how to free dive and you want this to be a spearfishing course, are they a good spear fisherman? Have they put down a lot of fish? How long have they been spearfishing, right? Same thing on free diving. Hey, are you gonna be my free dive instructor? How long have you been free diving? How many blackouts have you seen? How many LMCs have you seen, right? And yeah. ask these kind of questions right like tell me about those kind of experiences because if you're an instructor and you can't tell me about bad experiences and how you've handled adversity then i and again everyone started somewhere and this is not knocking on people that are trying to become instructors right there's a lot of other people who are guides or instructors or uh free dive instructors or spearfishing coaches whatever you want to call it right there's lots of people in this space that are entering right now right. and everyone's going to do it for the first time. And I think it's bad precedent for somebody who's going to say, Hey, you've never taught someone for money before. So sit down. You can't, you can't enter this, this cool kids club. Right. I think that that's ridiculous. Yeah. But what I do think um, that should be done is, Hey, you want to teach someone how to spearfish? Hey, you want to teach someone how to go free diving? Cool. Go do it. Do it, do it for like two or three, four years. The truth is before I ever became a guide, I was guiding for free for years and just didn't even realize it. I was the one coordinating the boats, right? I was coordinating the hotels. I was coordinating the, the flights, the time of years, where to go. And then even then when we got there, because exactly like, as you said, I already shot some of these fish over and over and over again. I was like, well, shooting a 40 pound cubera isn't exactly going to get my rocks off, but guess what? Mike over here is going to lose it and go stripping the I'm entire game for that. Yeah. yeah I would be losing it. Entire, yeah. He's going to run to the hotel naked for sure. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, so I had started doing those things for years before I ever started charging for it. Right. It was like, right. Oh, wait. Like I'd make everyone like everyone's life easier when you don't have to think. That's what people are paying for. Right. They're paying for the convenience of not having to put together the logistics. Um, the photography, right? The underwater photography is another big thing, you know? Right. Um, they get the good photos. Um, yeah, know. I'd be stoked on a 40 pound uh, snapper. Or, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> there's just, we don't, have, yeah. Um, one thing too, I want to say, like, there's the other side of it where you might have uh, older instructors that are more like peeing everywhere trying to mark their territory because essentially these younger guys and girls coming up and they're like, oh, they're going to take a bit of this chunk of my cash out of my pocket because now you've got all these younger guys coming up. So it's like I can see that side of it where uh, uh, but I but I can see that side of it. But I don't think that like I've talked about this before, actually, with Charlie, the older guys like Martin and, and Ted, like they're not worried about it. Like 
they're doing just fine because they are who they are. But the guys that have been uh, doing it a long time, maybe they're not as popular. Like they're still, you know, searching for coins, man. They're still like, they've got a business to run. And then here you have this influx of people that uh, some of them are majority, probably a majority, I will say the majority of them are probably pretty squared away and some of them aren't. But um, so it's just like, I think you brought a good point about um, like making sure in my spirit, what I want to get out of this course and is the course geared to free diving? Um, because now I've, I've seen a couple people gear courses, they gear them to free diving, but they're big time spear fishermen. And um, we talk about hanging, you know, at 80 feet to make sure we like just assimilate, like being on the bottom to assimilate being on the bottom and all that stuff and working through those skills things. But yeah, I think you bring That's up some I good do. points. I, I, I do spear fishing courses, right? I I'll, I'll do them. It, this is not patty affiliated. This is, which is what my certification is in. Right. right. And, and again, this is nothing against patty or FII or PFI, right? Because the truth is once upon a time, there was somebody who decided to say, Hey, I'm going to start this agency called patty. One day I'm going to start this agency. That's called PFI, right? Kirk crack, right? I'm, I'm yep. sorry. FI, Martin's a panic, right? There was one dude who said, Hey, this is what I think. And then that curriculum became accepted by others. So the truth is, um, you know, you don't have to do something that's the, the benefit of doing something agency uh, backed is that you are getting history, right? And so, and so to some degree, when you're going, let's say outside of skiing boundaries for the sake of better, right? right. You do one of these, these off the wall spearfishing courses like I offer, right? And I do offer patty courses as well. Um, but to do, and, you know, Charlie offers them as well. Um, you know, there's a couple other guys that do these. And um, my biggest thing would be just when you, when you go underneath that ski rope, and you take on the risk you say hey i know what i'm doing is not agency backed right right um, and, and if you're going to do that you should know who you're doing it with right and therefore the power of social media is good right um and and for those of the older guys that are trying to pee everywhere as i think is the analogy that you yeah know. that's what i said yeah piss on yeah. everything um, mark their territory yeah right i i would just say that i think just like when the pole spears all started getting better and better it i call me american i don't know but um for yeah those, for those of you out there who are like pro america and you know all these things i would think you would also be pretty okay with competition right that's what america's founded on is work hard keep your nose down um well ideally it makes you better right right, right. It, it, do the right things yeah, it makes you better because if I know someone, you know, like, for example, you brought up a good point, the spearfishing thing, like there is no course that I actually was doing, uh, trying to put together spearfishing courses and I couldn't get insurance anywhere because you talk to me because I found insurance and I'm working on creating an agency where you would then have umbrella insurance for all the other instructors. So that's, yeah. in, that's in the to-do list. Okay. Well, cool. And so, but uh, yeah. And it was like, um, because there's so, spearfish is so completely different than free diving. There's just so many things involved in it other than just diving down. Right. Um, you, you, you forgot how different it is in South Florida versus North Florida versus South, South California versus yeah. NorCal versus wherever. Right. I mean, night and day cave, Louisiana. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. And, and not only that, now here's where it gets into an interesting thing that I kind of cover in my course that I was talking about was, now you get someone that's like, good. Yeah, I can go, you know, like uh, we get divers. When I was at my old job, we would get divers. Like, what's your background diving? You know, I dove in uh, Tahiti. I dove in uh, Hawaii. I dove in Fiji. And you're like, okay, cool. You're not, now you're diving in Southern California, which is what you're talking about. Kind of like where we're diving in the bay and the estuaries here. And it's like, maybe. You can have that. You can keep Yeah. That. Well, we have like two feet of this, right? And so, but not only that now, now you take someone from theoretically, you could take someone from, let's say inland, um, never stepped foot in the ocean before ever in their life. Like a, like a spring master. Yeah. Well, they could just sign up. Yeah. Or whoever, maybe they, yeah. Spring, they sign up and they take a free diving course or they take even a spear fishing course. Uh, and then it's like, okay, now I'm going to go spear fishing. I was like, dude, you don't know one thing about the ocean and how to read ocean conditions. Um, and that's not shitting on anybody at all. 
that's just true. Like there's people that go in the ocean for the first time and panic and drown. There's, I see it every summer. So the fact that people can do that and it's like, there's not any way to teach people. There's any curriculum right as of now that I know of like designated teach people. Um, so, so Waterman survival, it's like associated with FII and you'd have to talk to Errol. I don't know if you've spoken to Errol yet, but if- no, but I know Waterman survival. Okay. So I do know that. I, I, w- I would. And you just reminded me of that. <laughs> so, and, and, and you, you talk about these clicks and right. And it's like, Errol and, and, and these guys are all very much in, in, in the, intertwined with, you know, people that are considered in a clique that's different than the clique that I'm a part of and all these different things. But like, hey, listen, dude, the guy's really, really fucking good at what he does. And, you know, I would highly recommend you talk to him. Um, he's got uh, something done with FII. Um, uh, Duncan Scary, who ended up uh, buying Florida Freedivers, has got some sort of uh, PFI spearfishing course coming out here very soon if not already out so there's there are now starting to become these these agency back courses um so they're they're starting to come out but they're just, and the truth is for any one of these agency courses to get any sort of traction you're gonna have to have five or six or seven you know experts or instagram famous guys or whatever you want to call it put their 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 stamp of approval on it right and and once you get a conglomerate of people that put their approval on a curriculum then you know then it then it comes down to operations management can whoever is running the show keep keep that hamster wheel rolling in a profitable manner because if it's not profitable guess what it's going to get shut down well it's funny you say that because i actually developed my own course because of that i didn't realize well they haven't come out yet i guess but i didn't even realize that so i said fuck it and i created my own like uh mentorship program kind of thing that i'm coming out with um february 1st and it's kind of like obviously i talk a lot about ted but he kind of inspired me i was like okay well cool um because i i felt like that was significantly lacking the overall spearfishing there's free dive stuff everywhere but like there's nothing like i remember just having so many questions for myself and you figure it out by reading and then over the years especially doing this podcast i'd had so so many people message me and i'd like to call me whatever uh message me and i'd give them you know to the point where my wife would be like hey uh you know we're in the middle of something and you're like responding <laughs> But it's like, the point is there's so many people out there with so many questions that could easily be answered if, you know, um, you just, if we just put something together, there's something out there for everything. And then, right. I mean, you can put together whatever you want in terms of curriculum for spearfishing, but the truth is experience. you You can hand a shaft that's not rigged to 10 different people and tell them to tie a fucking knot. And, and tie it to, or, or rig that spear gun, right? You can give 10 wooden enclosed track spear guns to 10 different people and ask them to rig this gun or this shaft. And I guarantee you, you're gonna get at minimum five different. So it's funny, I address that in the course too, because I say, look, this is my preferred method. This is how I like to do it in this situation. And this is why. Other people do other things and it does not make them wrong at all. Like you said, diving in South Florida, diving on the Gulf, diving wherever is always different. And there's these little tweaks that happen for a reason, you know, diving around wrecks, the gear you might. Somebody, somebody spent a lot of time and a lot of money and then the opportunity came and then they blew it. And now they're going to change what they were doing. A hundred percent. And we have all been there, including myself. And I will not make that mistake again. So that's why I, in the core and my little thing, I was just like, uh, look, this is how I prefer to rig this for this environment. Uh, here are the knots I like, and here's why, um, you know, but, and, and teach people the concept of everything so they can play with it. But at least it gives you a starting point for people to understand where to go and, and why, um, like we talk about, uh, Dyneema versus, and we'll get into this right now, but like Dyneema, like different types of rig. Why do people use monofilament? Uh, you know, why do people use Dyneema? Why do people use cable? I What's the deal? don't have a single good reason for monofilament outside of it's easy to cut. Me neither. That, that, like there's not a single, and I would actually love if you get somebody on here that comes up with a good reason. I hope you post it and then tag me so that I can, so that I can, I can. Well, 
<laughs> the only other thing is it travels through the water really fast and really easy. So it's real. So yeah, you can use a much. These dynamas are getting so in the beginning. I agree when we were using like you, 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 um, pH, whatever, right? Like all yeah, these weird type the of high things. molecular. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's ridiculous how good some of the materials are getting right now. And if the reason you shot, didn't shoot that fish was because of, the microseconds that Thank we're you. saving off of this. Thank you. Uh, I don't think you should have taken that shot. Right. right? Like, like this is supposed to be for sport. And, and unless, unless you literally are about to starve or you're doing this for a living. And even then, if you're doing this for a living, you're, you're good enough. Get closer. Yeah. So closer. there's one thing that you bring up and it's funny because we are creating like an industry. And I say we, cause I include myself in there too. Like everyone's creating this industry uh -huh. as a product or something. Right. So everyone's doing this. The funny thing is, is that, you know, and there's 10, five, you said five different ways, 10 people will rig their stuff up. And you know, the funny thing is probably all five will work just fine. Um, but again, you know, what people say that you need and what you need sometimes can be two different things. And um, Maybe based on what they, what works for them. Right. And in their area, your, your feet are different than my feet and it's different than, than Ted's feet. And it's different than John. Right. And you know what? There's no foot pocket. That's better than the rest. There's no carbon fiber blade. That's better than the rest. Cause at some point in time, a composite is a composite is a composite. And half these guys are getting the composite material from the same, you know, the same lay. Uh, my favorite thing is, so if anybody wants to have fun with this, go and download the uh, Alibaba app or whatever it is. Uh -huh. And if you look at the stuff they're selling, you see where everybody gets their wetsuits from. You see where everybody gets their leader fence style fin from. For mm -hmm. And you see how much they're getting them for. So you have an idea of the mark markup. And it's business. It is no, what, what it is. What you're, what you're not seeing is when you go and buy those, when you're on Alibaba and you can see that, okay, I can just go get that. Well, chances yeah. are that product isn't even going to be what you think it is. Everyone just thinks it's as easy as go on Alibaba. Oh, they say there's a, there's a, so that's what I was going to get at was that unless you go to that factory and see what you're producing, because you could order from the same thing and get three different, like three different times and get three different, you know, I talked to Brad Thompson about this and he's a orange County guy. And he was saying, I actually save money by doing business here in America because I have much more control over what quality and what I'm getting. I literally just brought back my fin manufacturing to America um, because of that. I got tired of working with people in Turkey where quality control, whatever, right? I just, it, I was over it, right? And now with shipping costs going through the roof, it's, <laughs> you're not saving anything, right? And you're just yeah. getting a headache. Like I have way more control. I can literally walk into that, into that warehouse and I can get something done and get something accomplished, right? My, my, every single one of my pole spears is all, all, all the aluminum is made on my mill runs. I have miles and miles of aluminum made for me, <laughs> literally made for me. I know exactly what alloys in it. I have a third party metal certified certification. I know exactly what's in my, what's in my metals. Um, if it's metal and it's on one of my pole spears, it was made in America, right? So your pole spear, let's talk about your, your gear, because I really want to, so you mentioned aluminum, you're a pole spear guy, um, mm -hmm. aluminum, carbon fiber, fiberglass. What's your thoughts on all that stuff? Because carbon fiber is right. Lighter snap, whatever it is. Place, time and place and situation and person that's using it. Right. Um, people say, okay, aluminum once upon a time, right? Aluminum wasn't as expensive as it is now, right? So the, the price, the price differential between an aluminum spear and a carbon fiber spear has diminished because aluminum prices have gone up. Composites have gotten cheaper to, because it, as a technology, it's been produced more often now. So now it's gotten better, right? That's just the way right. that uh, any introduction of a, any technological advancement happens, right? It at first comes out, it's expensive. People start figuring out production you know, and it gets cheaper, right? So that gap of cost for composite materials, whether it be fiberglass or carbon fiber has definitely gotten cheaper to produce and aluminum has actually become more expensive. But once upon a time, people bought aluminum spheres because they were cheaper and heavier because they wanted that punch. Well, 
these composite spears are so fast now and with the introduction of rollers versus non-rollers which we can get there um yeah, we will yeah yeah right that, that's all that's a whole nother another subject but the reason why i like aluminum is when you're in the bahamas and you don't have a dive store or 17 other pole spears on deck um and your section bends with aluminum most of the time it bends it doesn't break right most cases if you do get a fish that's big enough to bend your aluminum section pole spear it's gonna bend sure guess what bend it back slowly roll it on concrete hit it with a mallet or something soft or you know at least soft face so you're not dinging into the metal right and you can get that thing pretty straight granted it may have a little bit of a, a you know an s to it but guess what you're shooting a pole spear inside of a rock at a fish that's rocked up you don't need it to be perfectly straight right you are going to make contact with it if you're in close quarters now if you're trying to take that same s-shaped pole spear and shoot something that's out in the open okay we can have a different conversation about that right, right. Um, but when composites fail they snap there's no more usage there's no okay let me wrap some duct tape on it and hope it works it's just it's done it's over. splinters right yeah. there's, there's nothing left to it right so when you talk about being in a remote area or remote location and you talk about last stand, you know, Call of Duty fans, right? Last stand or you know, last chance, right? You got this wounded pole spear, but guess what? It still works because it's aluminum and you were able to bend it back, right? Um, that's one of the reasons I personally like aluminum spears. Now, with that said, do I find benefit in the carbon? Absolutely. Because guess what? Sometimes carbon will bend and come right back, right? If it bends- There's the a little bit of flex, yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's going to come right back. Um, with aluminum, if it bends to the point where some carbon fiber pole spears you see bend to, it, they're going to stay bent. They're not going to come back. Yeah, or just explode and fail completely, right? Anything carbon fiber just <laughs> fails. I, I, don't, I don't care how good it is. And, and that was a little bit annoying. And it was, part, I, hey, I was part of it. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, our pole spear is bigger, better, stronger, faster, right? um it's marketing for you right like but now yeah, like, it is what it is yeah but but now you'll literally hear me say people be like oh but that's not your pole spear it must suck and i'm like no it's actually a damn good pole spear like right you, you've got it and, and i really don't care this is, people say oh that's bad you're not helping your business i really don't care dude look the, the headhunter nomad is a is a great pole spear for a lot of people right okay well at some spear. point you can only do so much with what a pole spear like it's a, a pole spear is just right like it's some, and I say the same thing, even for spear fishing equipment, like at some point, if you have a straight track, you know, and a balanced gun, that thing's going to fire and it's going to go straight with a straight, if it's the shit straight, you'll be fine. Regardless of whatever name you stick on it. If it's a straight track and a st straight shaft, it could be all right. Now, 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 but that's, that's what you're saying is if it's a straight track, well, guess yeah. what? That comes to the craftsmanship. Okay. So there is, right. there is such thing as not all pole spears are created equal, right? There is such yes. thing as some guys that are good and they've got it dialed and they've got their procedures in and those are the brands that you trust because they are able to consistently put out this equipment. And this is not a knock on the garage guys who put them together because some of those guys are even better craftsmen. Well, it's just the process. Yeah, it's right. the process. And, and, and inevitably, the more you do, the more chances you have for error, right? That's right. That, and, and except the difference is now when you have error, you're no longer messing up on a batch of 10. You're messing up on a batch of a thousand. And let me tell you, that hurts. When you yeah, make, I can't imagine that. When, when you make a, a, a wrong decision, right? And I did, did all the CNC machining in Miami initially. Initially, every single pole sphere was machined in an aviation machine shop that I worked at for years prior to this, right? And, yeah. and now I have it in Chicago because I'm, I can't, I can't possibly have it all underneath one roof. It's impossible. And, and why would I bother when I'm not an expert machinist, but the guy who machines it now is. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it just, it just makes sense for me. Um, so I actually have both aluminum and composite pole spears. And I even have a hybrid with a guy named Christopher Tavera um, that, you know, in, it, it combines both, right. So that you get the benefits from both both types right um you know and so it started with the pole spear stuff right but then uh it slowly started growing um 
you know, I started doing gloves, um, you know, and then after gloves, I started doing dive bags. And then after dive bags, I started doing wetsuits. And after wetsuits, I did fins. And now I even have spear guns. And it's I have how's the wetsuit thing going? I'm just curious about that. Because it seems like, you know, there's so many different kinds of wetsuits out there. And a lot of them like the same thing, like a wetsuit. If you do this and do this and do this, it's pretty much if you yeah. blind stitch it, if you glue it, it's the same as everybody else. Like, right. So glued blind stitch. Yamamoto rubber, I Yamamoto guess. Yamamoto 39, right? Not yeah. chloroprene or, you know, some of these other things that are, that are coming out, right? That's the best. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there that produce that. The biggest thing I would just say is when wetsuits fail, and I've had other brands where they failed, and what's their warranty look like at the end of the day like what's their customer service look like and, th and i think that's what truly separates Good point them. marketing is, is huge for a lot of companies but the truth is just hey man i get it and, and and maybe it's i get it because i'm on both sides i've been on both sides but like i get it shit happens they, they didn't sell you I, I i hope that they didn't sell you that that wetsuit or that spear gun or whatever or that pair of carbon fiber fins and say i hope this breaks on this guy nobody does that Nobody does that. Now, the question is, when you have something go wrong, how are you going to react? Are you going to take care of them? Or are you going to leave them feeling like they were used and abused, right? And yeah. I think that that's also a two-way street from the consumer, right? Because I've been, again, because I've been on both sides, I've had somebody return something that I personally felt wasn't worthy of return, right? Right um you know, it's like <laughs> no i understand i actually it's funny you say that because today i was asking myself that same question where and, and now kind of in a digital text a digital form of being on the same side where it's like a 30-day money-back guarantee and it's like well what if someone is just wants to get a free course and just goes oh, i'm not happy now because there are people like that you know but i think for the most part of uh, in the spear fishing industry I think you're right. I think the people that do well, the people that I kind of support on this show too, but also just in person, like my friend, Paul, um, from hot rod spear guns, like that guy's like, send it back to me. I'm gonna fix it. Send it back to me. I'll send you a new gun. Don't worry about it. I'll send it. I'll take care of it. And it's like, man, that's fucking awesome compared to some other industries, you know? Well, you know, and again, I think, I think it, you got to look at it. Like, you know, like I said, like if, if you, take a bantam pole spear one of my bantam pole spears which i tell everyone hey look if you plan on shooting a grouper over 40 pounds and you expect this to be straight when it's done i'm gonna let you know right now you have a 50 50 chance right you have a 50 50 chance when you go into battle with a 40 plus pound grouper with a 5 8 pole spear the front section may end up being bent granted listen we've we've shot 90 pound groupers with a with a 5 8 pole spear and not bent it right but it's the way you shot it the way that that fish ran into that rock, the way he turned at the right second, right? There's so many different things. You know, you can have a 20 pound fish bend a shaft where a hundred pound fish doesn't, right? It, it happens all the time. And you just have to say, hey, look, as a consumer, I bought this spear. I wanted it to be smaller because it was lighter. Um, so I can get some of those harder to reach fish. So when I shoot a 50, 60 pound fish and it bends the front section slightly, am I going to turn around and say, demand a brand new pole spear, entire pole spear for everything? No. Hey, are you going to replace the front section? Okay. And if the front sections, I don't even know, I'm saying arbitrary numbers right now. I don't know what mine are. I think they're like 60, 70 bucks. And if instead of it being 60, 70 bucks, you're like, Hey dude, give it to you for 30 bucks. It's like, okay, cool. Like they still have costs, you know, they like everyone still has operating costs. And it wasn't like you went to go shoot a, a trigger fish or or a small sheep's head and the yeah. snapped right or broke or bent i or stabbed a fish in the head one time very first time using this knife i brained it and then i went to pull it out and this was a small fish and uh right. it was 10 pounds and the knife snapped in half i was like dude i've been hunting with a lot of knives like and i didn't say anything other than i messaged the guy and i just said the the manufacturer and i said hey fyi like you said i'm pretty sure this thing was made in china or something but you might have got a bad batch I've never had something like that happen before just snap in half mm -hmm. um just fyi so that you can keep an eye out so you know you might either change your formula or whatever it is just so you know because i don't 
I believe in really helping everybody. And, you know, like you said, shit happens. Like I'd want to know if something was wrong with my stuff. And um, the guy's like, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll look into it. And I'm like, okay. Right. But, but now let me ask you this question. If you would have taken that same knife and stabbed it into like a 200 pound bluefin tuna skull. And as you had it in its head, it started doing the tuna shakes and then it snapped. Do you think you would still have the same impression on that product? Probably not. I can say that I would be my level of being disappointed and pissed would have been much higher. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, but I would have said, I would have said, I'm never, I definitely would be like, I'm not going to publicly say anything other than, hey man, like this thing. Yeah, I'd probably like, I'm not ever going to fucking use that again. Like right. definitely not going to use that brand again. Right. Because I don't want that to happen to me ever again, which is what led me myself into making a lot of my own stuff. Just so when you get that dream shot, you know, when you pull the trigger, you're good to go because and that's not crapping on anybody else's. I just know that if it does fail, I got no one to blame but myself. Hey, I get you know, that. yeah, yeah, I know you get that because it's probably why you got into your stuff too. Yeah, but it's like, but that's it, you know. Um, unless I really believe, you know, unless I don't know, that's just my personal thing. I mean, mm. there's a lot of good stuff out there, lots of good stuff. There's some, you know, one thing I'll say. Uh, speaking of floats too, like and um, uh, good equipment, I think like. Gannett, I don't know. Do you are you familiar with Gannett using Gannett floats or anything like that? I use their foot lines. Yeah. So Gannett, uh, Evolve, and a couple other companies kind of adopted the same concept of floats mm. um, and the inflatable floats. And I got and I know Diver R had their big dog stopper that I used one time. But I got to say, like when he did that, and I say he is a Gara, but I, he did that. I was like, dude, this is such a better product than just generic blow up like everybody's blowing it up and the stuff pops like this thing is so solid um and so i respect people like that 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 take something and then they really um don't don't accept mediocre in some ways like and they're like no we can make this better and they did it and it's like pretty cool um i know evolve took it a step further too and they put carbon fiber um around the uh the edge of it to like further reinforce it still breaks down but i don't know anyways for puncturing resistance things like that but like there's cool to see people like that really stepping it up so um but so besides equipment though you also you do a lot of your your trips right you do guides guided service and your guided service is that primarily you said in key west and south florida or it's it's literally everywhere um so yeah, I initially started um, by working with other people, right? Like, so I work with uh, like Max there in San Diego with the bluefin tuna thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I coordinate bringing people to work with him, right? He, and why would I ever in a million years pretend that I can find bluefin tuna better than Max or better than Fusaki or better than you know, yeah, you know, Chris Schultz, right? yeah, right? Like, or, or yeah. any of these guys, like. And especially working alongside, you know, somebody like Austin, like Austin's the man, right? He's, he knows what he's, how doing. do you know all those guys? I just be in just from out there. Oh, you, when you, you were out here before or what? Yeah. Oh yeah. I've been out there for a few years. And then, uh, and then actually um, last year I ran 20 days out of San Diego. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We landed yeah. a lot of tuna, like a lot of tuna. <laughs> through Mad Max. Yeah. Through Max. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, you know, essentially agency booking, right. Yeah. Right. And I handle all the logistics for these guys, right. I have the guns there, uh, the float float lines ready. Um, I jump in I, every single time someone's jumping in off the back of the boat, right. They're sitting there right with their, their mask on their fins on the guns loaded, right. They're, they're getting ready to, to roll. Right. And as soon as we get meter marks or something, you know, I'm literally right behind them. It's almost like we're sitting on a motorcycle, right? Because I'm like, all right, as soon as they go, I'm going. And as soon as they're diving, I'm diving right on their fin tips because it's a safety thing, right? Like things can happen. They can get wrapped up. They can, if they, maybe they're looking over their left-hand shoulder, but the fish are on the right-hand side. So I can bark at them and then they know, oh shit, let me. Let yeah, me it's good customer out. service. So how does that work? Do you get like people in your area hit you up? Hey, uh, hey. In the world are hitting me up now. Really? And yeah. then you just refer them over to them or uh, no, I go, I go, I go there. Like I set up time zones uh, where I go and I work with these, 
uh, these different captains and, and, you know, for example, like I leave in two days, Tuesday, uh, you know, and then I'm going to go, you know, hang out with my buddy, Sean, like I've been diving with Sean for eight years in Costa Rica. Right. You know, and uh-huh. I was a fan of his for a long time. Um, it was like I said, and then the last two years, three years of Costa Rica, I've pretty much every single time brought down friends of mine, uh, let them get the easy opportunities when the big fish are sitting there staring at them saying, Hey, shoot me in the face. Right. You know, doing the whole thing. And then, Um, you know, when I started being a full-time guide last year, um, you know, this is actually the first time that I'm going to be there for two months. Yeah. It's funny. The whole guide thing too, because, um, like you said, you end up doing it for free anyways. Uh, when my buddies wanted to go fishing and being the more experienced, you just end up guiding them naturally. Mm -hmm. And like, sometimes, sometimes you're not a team player like that. And sometimes you don't have the ability to help people be the better, right? Like some, some of my guys, you know, they call me coach or, you know, like all kinds of dumb, they call me, they call me dumbass too sometimes, you know, Um, (laughs) you know, but it's, you know, not everybody wants to help other people get better or or not everyone can get the best out of their, you know, their guys. And I've got a, I've got a handful of guys that dive with me at least once a month, if not twice a month. And they've been diving with me for eight, eight months, maybe maybe and they all now can comfortably pull trigger at like 75 that's like great all of, them, all of them so i have a question for you do do local so i talked to charlie a little bit about this too do local like die uh, charter captains local guides or whatever you want to call them do they get bent when and i guess i don't if you do they if you're bringing a business why would they i guess but like do they get bent like you're like hey i'm gonna do a spear fishing like what do you call i'm gonna like do a spear fishing guided service but you're basically i'm bringing you the guys and you're gonna be the guide or like you already have a relation you already have a relationship with right. max uh, so that he yeah. knows what the deal is when you show up oh oh dude we, t- we talk about it right and max max doesn't die you know and again it's it's a different level of service right like it, it, this is not um uh this is not a replacement guide this is i'm an in water I'm literally in the water right? as a, as a captain, if you're captaining a vessel, you can't be driving the boat water with the clients. Right. So not that I'm coming in and doing a better job or guiding, you know, it's they, why, why would I, even though I know where fish are, why uh-huh. would I fight, you know, other people in, in the industry, I, why would not work with? Yeah, them? no, I was just thinking about it where like through surfing or something where it's like, Oh, let me get this straight, dude. You're going to come to my, like, hear me out. Okay. You're coming yeah. like some random guy that's from Florida is coming to my backyard to take business. And this isn't me. I'm just saying like to take business, um, away from I'm competing now with some spearfishing guy that comes from somewhere else, brings people and then, um, uh, shoots fish in my backyard and he gets paid for it. But I guess if you're paying the you're paying full charter and all that, right? So it's like I, I'm not listen, I'm not paying less. Like, like, like if you are a charter and your price is X, I'm coming in and I'm paying X. Okay. And, I, and then I'm charging X point no, two. I just have to be forthright because at first, like I remember seeing like I think it was Kurt Kem uh or Cam Kirkconnell. Um geez. and I remember seeing him here diving. And he was like, come do bluefin charters with me or whatever. And I was like, dude, I wonder if guys get pissed. Cause they're like, why don't you come do bluefin charters with me that lives here? Sure. Well, there, no, I didn't know. I just curious. But also, I mean, there's a lot of people, at least, at least when you're doing it right. And, and, and Cam and other people, right. Are, are using the right method. If they are doing it in this way, where yeah. using somebody who's coast guard certified, somebody Who's an actual charter, an actual yeah. charter, right? Like a right. legitimized service, um, which is a pain in the ass here, by the way. But yeah, oh, it's terrible, right? You guys, <laughs> you guys jump through hoops, so I, I can either a absorb. I started, life. I started to do it. I started looking to do it, and I was like, you know what? Like, fuck that. I'll do guard, guarded stuff in Baja and guided stuff here from shore. I like, I'll take people out. Um, I got my captain. I got all this stuff, but. I don't really want to deal with all that crap of like paying fees and doing that. And like, I'm just like, you know what? I'll just take my buddy spearfishing. That's well, all. I we'll think do. Also, I think also you're confusing a typical charter service with the service that myself and others who do business similar to mine 
Right. So like a spearfishing guide versus chartering a boat to go out fishing. Right, right. Those are two completely separate things. Okay, right? that's you know clear. Yeah, now I, okay, so totally understand now. It's, okay. It's, I'm, 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 not, I'm not a charter captain. I'm not the guy who's going to drive you and say, hey, there's a rock down there, go get it, right? I'm literally going to swim down first poke my head down and say, and, and scope the situation out and say, nope, nothing here. You don't have to waste your breath hold on this, right? Because not everyone can up, down, up, down, up, down, right? And they only get so many of these peak performance dives. Right? Yeah, no, I understand. Check out a spot. So what I do is, right, I go down, boop, okay, yeah, perfect. And then I, I map it out for them. Hey, you go check out here, look here, right? Or even some of these guys who don't need that kind of level of handheld holding, what they want is a guaranteed person yes. that they trust right like hey if i go down to 90 foot this time which is outside of my comfort zone but because i saw that fish there i know that cj is going to be 20 feet behind me and ready to rip that line up or help me get to the surface or whatever the case is and you know a lot of the guys who are constantly with me i at one point in time or another have been the difference between them coming back home or not no, I understand that. And I think too, the other side is like, from my perspective, when I talk about um, uh, spearfishing guide, especially in Baja, it's like, what you're paying me for is you're paying me for my resources and my experience rather than you having to figure it all out and spend the majority of the time, and, like and getting- like, like we're making a killing. No, <laughs> no, I'm basically just want to get paid for free to like, and to make a couple extra, make some money just to go- get people stoked on diving which is cool but i know like years ago we went down and figured it all out but i figured it out over the course of years or months of going and trying to figure it out people don't have time for that shit going, going at the wrong time looking for oh the god wrong yeah fish you know and, and i personally have done that right like i was on the other side of it where you know i spent three grand went down there and laid a goose egg and was like well that sucked Oh, I wanted this fish. Oh, but this isn't the time of year. Or, oh, I should have gone with that guy. He has way better service. This guy just ripped us off. Right. Um, yeah. Of, right. And so, and so what you're exactly what you're saying is you're paying for saving time. That's literally the only resource in the world that you cannot get back. Right. You can lose a hundred thousand dollars today. Guess what? You can earn it back and, and, and it sucks and you'd be pissed and you know, for me, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money. Right. Um, but when you talk about something that you can't get back, it's time and you, and you want to help somebody get there faster, get to that fish. That's, that's really what, what I do. And then, you know, there's a lot of guys who can put you on fish, but not everyone gets along. And that's the other thing is, you know, the guys that come out with me, they like me. Right. And, and guys that go out with different guides, like that type of personality right? that's a big thing when choosing even a free dive instructor too or anybody like, right like the, what's the compatibility are you guys gonna have a good time because guess what like and and actually one of the things that i that is really difficult to do uh as a guide is you know you may have two guys from here and two guys from there and they're getting together on a four guy trip well what happens when these two guys don't get along with the other two guys right then you end up with a, a, a shit time right so one yeah. of the things that i think people underplay on what i do is is i vet the people that i work with so so carefully because i've had i've made the mistake where i put i will we'll call them a dud in the group with with a, with a bunch of guys who were ready ready to do something and and maybe it's just different personalities too you know it's like right. oh this guy wants to dive at 30 feet well dude i'm fish i'm tired of hogfish you florida guys <laughs> are fucking hogfish i was telling my buddy we should make like just uh like uh star like a war like a shit talking war like a friendly way but just talk shit you mean between forth. california sheep's head and fucking Falcota yes hogfish. fuck your hogfish right but i totally understand what you're saying though it would be just so funny because there's so much ammo though just to go from both sides like just to have you know we don't care about your white sea bass nobody cares about your shitty diving biz you know like i can see you guys just like having a field day with us yeah <laughs> Anyways, you know, what Florida guys go out to California and, and they get their shit kicked in because they're not used to dirty or cold ass water and five millimeter wetsuits, you know? Um, yeah, it's just different. Very different. So, but cool, man. Hey, I really appreciate you having me out and uh, 
you know, I'm definitely looking forward to touching base with you, especially when I'm in San Diego again this year. No, that's great, man. Well, yeah, we'll go out diving just for fun or whatever. I don't know what you got going on, but um, no, I, I appreciate it. 